forgiveness and your mercy and your grace is greater, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, whatever our questions are.
took over there. I know it's kind of hard to concentrate on two things at once, but uh, if you'll just listen to what I've got to say, it's very important. Um, I want to thank this church. I'm just so thankful for the support that we received. Um, Africa was awesome. Uh, it was a, uh, just a wonderful eye-opening experience, and uh, it was a wonderful time with my daughter. Uh, it's something that we won't ever forget. Uh, I'm very proud of her. She uh, poured her heart out in Africa, and uh, you know, I mean, the Lord just drew us close. I mean, there's just a closeness, a bond between us now. <laughs> but uh, before I get wound up, I just wanted to let her say a few words. Like I said in the first service, we just take everything for granted here. Um, I knew it was going to be different. Like, I expected that going over there. But then you go over there and you realize how different it really is. How, like, run down it is over there. Um, the kids down there were amazing. Like, I could have taken them home. Um, it was just really humbling to go over there. They would, we would be in one of the orphanages that we stayed at or visited. They would come up to me whenever they would see the dirt on my legs. And they would wipe the dirt off my legs, because they didn't want me dirty. It's okay if they're dirty, because they're used to it. But it's like, they always wanted to serve you. They would get up if I was standing, and they'd say, here, you have my chair. And I was like, no, you can have it. And they were like, but we want you to have it. And they always, they were like, do you, do you have to go? Do you have to, can you stay here with us? And we were, we were I'm definitely going back. But it's just, it was just really humbling. I don't think I'm ever gonna take anything for granted here, because even the littlest toys we would give them, they were just fascinated by it, like little bookmarks or anything. They were like, we, just, we don't know what this is or anything. I don't know, it was really different over there, but it was a really good experience. <laughs> uh-huh. You know, um, I've told people that it's really hard to explain uh, how wonderful it was over there. It's like taking a picture of the Grand Canyon and uh, trying to explain it to somebody. You know, we saw people over there that were physically poor, but spiritually ri rich. And it was a common theme. Uh, these Christian orphanages that we went to over there, we had a, we went to an inner city orphanage. We went to one right outside of the, uh, right outside the town, and we went to one out on a farm or further out, kind of a farm type environment. But uh, there was a common theme in those orphanages, and it was the love of Christ. Uh, here's a place that is surrounded by, like I said, with gross po poverty. And uh, it's a Muslim community and the oppression and the depression that goes with that. And here is these like lights on a hill, these little orphanages. And you see children just being loved and being fed and being clothed. And the love that was poured into them was being poured right back out into their community. And it, it was just... It was just such an awesome thing to see the, the stark contrast there. Um, you know, the kids there, they were so loving. Chloe said, you know, they were like our own. Well, they were like my own. I mean, I developed, it's just amazing, in two days, you know, you can develop such a close relationship with a boy and hear, hear their story and the, the heartache they've been through. I mean, these are kids who've lost parents and, and uh, you know, just, you know, they asked me my story. Well, you know, I don't really have, a, uh, you know, when you hear about parents dying, and, you know, I don't have a story. But when you hear a little kid with tears in her eyes share the story, you know, just break your heart. I mean, just break it. But, um, you know, I was uh, the thing, um, just to try to, to show you their heart, um, I, I showed some, uh, some girls over there picture of Will, you know, and they're just so innocent and pure, and they just laugh and, uh, just wonderful. You know, Chloe's talking about serving. Their greatest thing, you know, was to slice up a tomato and bring it out to me. You know, they would, three of them would come out there. And it was just an honor for them to, to it was an honor for me. But, it, you know, that was an honor for them to serve me. And, oh, man, it was just beautiful. But I wanted to read a little thing this, this girl wrote. Not to embarrass my son, but just try to show you the heart of him. But uh, one little girl wrote, Will Lev. And it said, Dear Will, I humbly write this letter to you in the name of our Almighty God. For me here things are great, and I pray to God every day to protect you and your family members. I just thank for, for God for enabling me to pass through this term without, without feeling any sickness. 
Also, I want to give glory to God who has provided us with the blessings of salvation. I am Tenda Martha, and I'm 13 years old. I'm in primary seven, and I'm doing my primary exams in November. My best dish is chicken and rice. <laughs> And my best hobbies are reading novels, Bible, playing netball, and listening to gospel music because it restores my soul. I'm a born again Christian, and I <clears throat> I lead lunch. I lead young children. My memory verse in the book, or my my memory verse is in the book of Mark 10:27, which says that, and Jesus looked at them and said, "With man, they, all things are impossible, but with God, all things are possible." I wish you success everywhere you go. I will be very happy if you receive this for God in my country. Your lovely friend. I mean, here's a little girl never met Will. And when's the last time you wrote a letter in the name of our mighty God? You just awesome thing. You know, uh, like I said, there was a general theme of love. Um, just gratitude. Um, but we got to do some specific things while we were there. One of the things that we got to do, we got to pray for a little boy that had spinal bifida. And uh, the orphanage had, one of the orphanages ladies had taken him to a hospital. And uh, the father was there. He'd been holding the baby for three days. He had an infection. And uh, I got to encourage the dad. You know, we, I told him, we have a little boy with spinal bifida in this church. And if you know that little boy, he's the jewel of this church. Uh, another one of the pictures, there's a, me standing beside a man, an elderly man, and um, he was actually a pastor. He's been a pastor since the 70s. He was actually a pastor under Idi Amin. He was uh, thrown in prison three times, and he was tortured. Idi Amin himself stuck a gun in his mouth said, this is your mother, this is your father, this is the only power that you need to know. He said, stop preaching. You remember the thousands that he killed, but he's preaching today. As a matter of fact, he said, if I come back to Uganda, that I can go to prison with him and preach in prison with him. <laughs> I can tell you in that picture, I'm not worthy to stand beside him. You know, um, <clears throat> another common thing in Africa was the love there. But not just the love for us, but Africa says it sends its love to America. And two of the orphanages we went to, there was just there was some help there cooking. And the women said, you know, y'all have just done an awesome thing here. He goes, they go, I want you to go back to America and you tell them we are thankful and that we love America. Uh, another thing is, is that uh, they were the, there was a common theme of prayer. Uh, you know, I told one of the boys, you know, uh, well, one of the boys told me. Uh, it was just, I can't explain, you know, how you can love somebody. It was like, oh boy. But uh, I said, son, I'm going to pray for you. Or he said, I'm going to pray for you. He said, not little prayers, I'm going to send up big prayers. I said, I'm going to pray for you too. And he said, that's good. He said, because we are your brothers. We are your sisters. We are your sons and daughters in the streets. I want to thank you. You know, there was two scriptures that kept coming to mind over there. One of them was that He will be a father to the fatherless. That God revealed Himself in a great way to the children. Another one was Revelation 3.17. It says you are rich and, and uh, in need of nothing. But I tell you, you are blind, miserable, naked, and poor. That's so what I felt like. I thought I was doing good until I got to Africa. But it's you know, it really put something in me. You know, I don't love like I did there. But I thank the church. I will never forget it. And I want to go back. Thank you. That's the heartbeat of Jesus. Amen. Red, yellow, black, and white, they were all precious in His sight. Didn't we learn that as children? 
God doesn't look down from heaven and see white people, black people, brown people, you know, all the colors. He sees people. His children. And if your heart's never been broken, you need to go on a mission trip. People are different overseas. Have you ever been to South America or Africa? I've been to Europe a lot. They're kind of like we are in America. They're, they have some type of attitude thing over there, you know. They're secular and hard and cold. But you go to South America or Africa or some of these poorer countries, the people are so genuine. And when you talk to them, they're like, oh, they want to hear what you have to say. They don't put on a show like they're pretending, you know, in America. You start telling people about your church or what's important to you, and they're like, they just listen. You know, they, they're just listening. They're going to, they don't care, you know. But overseas, people are just, they don't have that facade. They're so genuine. And we don't understand that unless we go. Didn't Jesus say for us to go into all the world and preach the gospel? Can you take a year, I mean a week out of your life, a week every year, and go on a mission trip? How many weeks do you get for a vacation? Most of us get a couple. Take one of those weeks. Go with us on a mission trip. We're going to... Uh, Heidelberg, Germany. We're going to help build a church. There's a young pastor over there who bought a brewery in the middle of town. And he's gutted the brewery and we're building that brewery into a church. And what the devil used right, for his glory, we're taking that thing. We're redeeming it and we're, we're going to bring glory to God. And so our group, we got about 10 or 12 of us going over there and it's expensive and it costs money and we're doing Yard sales. Yard sales are embarrassing. I mean, that's not something grown-ups want to do. I don't. i got to humble myself to do a yard sale because people come in all snooty about all your stuff. and It's not good enough. For, you know, I just don't like them. But they make a lot of money. <laughs> and, and, and we go, because we're going to win souls, we're going to reach Heidelberg, Germany for Jesus. Because one young pastor got a vision, and we're going to support him. And churches all over America are taking turns. Every week, there's a new church. Every week, they're bringing money, they're bringing muscle, and they're building, building. We're going to go over there build, and we're going to bring the kingdom of God. We're going to take Jesus with us. You know, since lots happened this last week, since I spoke to you last, Robin Williams died. Remember the great actor, comedian Robin Williams? Some of you, you knew him as Mork from Ork. How many old people we got? Don't raise your hands. Remember Mark? I, I don't know how old I was, but I was young, and when he did his little thing with his hands, I, it's been so long, but Mark from Mark, it was just the coolest show ever, you know, and we just fell in love with Robin Williams, and some of you know him as Mrs. Doubtfire. Anybody know Mrs. Doubtfire? He touched our hearts, man. That guy touched our hearts, but uh, his life was such a paradox. Because he had such great humor. I mean, genius comedy. But he was wrapped up in such inner struggle and pain. I mean, who knew? I mean, who knows the heart of man? It boggles the mind how someone can be so funny but so tortured on the inside. What I like about him is that he loved our troops. I know you guys love the troops. A lot of you are the troops. <laughs> but he would go overseas a lot and he would... He would do his comedy routine and just encourage the troops. Not a lot of people in Hollyweird went go overseas, but um, he was one of the few that go overseas and cared enough to go. And he'd go over there and he'd perform, and then he'd just wear himself out on stage and love people. That was his gift. And then he would go home and he'd freshen up and he'd go back out at night with the guys and encourage them on an individual basis. Isn't that awesome? And I think in his tortured life with the, all of his inner demons and his addictions, I think that when he brought joy to other people, that it brought joy back to him. Isn't that, isn't that the way it works? Reciprocity. When you give to somebody out of heart of love, no matter what it is, food, clothing, humor, you know, the troops needed uplifting. He'd go over and uplift them, but he would get back so much more than he gave. And I think in his heart, tortured inner struggles, it really made him feel good when he did something good for other people. And that's the way I am. I think most everybody's like that. You know, I love to um, minister to people. 
I like to encourage young men. I like to encourage young women. I like to encourage little children. If you notice, all the little children come up and give me high fives. Right? And I love encouraging the children. I feel like I'm the, the grandpa, the surrogate grandpa of a lot of these kids. Um, did you know kids were important to Jesus? Yeah. Everyone knows that, Pastor. Well, did you know that Pinocchio was a bad motivational speaker? <laughs> Turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 10, verse 13. Oh, everybody knows Jesus loved children. That is the funniest commercial. I see untapped potential in you. <laughs> Unconvincing, was he? Mark 10, 13 is an incredible story. And we've got to get it in our spirit here. People were bringing children to Jesus and the disciples were rebuking them. Don't bother the master with these little rugrats, these little crumb crunchers. You're going to waste the master's time. That was their attitude. So let's read verse 13. It says, People were bringing little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them. But the disciples rebuked them. Who they rebuked? The children or the parents? Probably the parents. Uh, when Jesus saw this, he was indignant. That's like mad. Jesus got angry. Who did Jesus get angry at? The parents, the children, or the disciples? He got angry with the disciples. Their attitude. Jesus said, hey guys, no, no, no. He said, suffer. I like the King James. Suffer the little children. He says, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. And then he blew their minds with a new paradigm shift. He said, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly, I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a child will never enter it. That's scary, my friends. There's a lot of people thinking they're entering the kingdom of God. They're never entering it. They're not receiving the kingdom of God like a little child. And he took the children in his arms. Oh, don't you love it? Don't you love the oh, children? And he placed his hands on them and he blessed them. Can you imagine the life of a child that Jesus touched and blessed? <laughs> the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the creator of the universe puts his hands on you and blesses you. You're going to be blessed. Neuroimaging is a science that shows that as we age, the center of our thinking shifts from the right brain to the left brain. In other words, as we get older, we stop thinking with our right brain. We start thinking with our left brain. And this shift presents a grave spiritual problem. At some point, most of, us, most of us stop living out of imagination and we start living out of memory. Instead of creating the future, we start repeating the past. Instead of living by faith, we live by logic. Instead of going after our dreams, we retire. We give up dreaming and believing God for new conquests, new visions, and new territory. Kids are thinking with their right brain, full of faith and full of imagination. That's probably why he says the kingdom of heaven belongs to them. They have enough faith to dream big dreams and believe for the impossible. Do you remember the circle maker that we've been watching on Wednesday night? The pastor that he bought the church from in the inner city of D.C. All of his congregation really lived outside in Maryland, outside the city. So here he was, the pastor was 71 years old. And he was going outside into the suburbs to start his church all over again. Buy land. Put a building on it. Get his congregation together. At 71 years old, he was still dreaming. Is that fantastic? That's very unusual. Many people stop dreaming and live out of the logical left brain. And they stop growing. When you stop dreaming, you stop growing. When people stop growing, they become the critics of the people that are growing. You ever heard that before? People who stop growing just sit there and criticize people who try to make things better. This leads to tension in relationships. This leads to church splits. This leads to bad relationships. When we try to make things better, their favorite phrases are, what's wrong with the way things are? If it ain't broke, 
You guys in the military heard that one. That's the way we've always done it. That's the way we've always done it. Just leave well enough alone. We've never done it that way before. I like the King James Version of that scripture about the children. It says, suffer the little children to come unto me. Because in a way, if you've ever worked with children before, it's very stressful. How many people work with children? It's a little stressful, isn't it? Um, it's not easy. It's inconvenient. It's time consuming. It's hard work to make little disciples, to work with kids. You really do it out of love. I mean, nobody would do it for any other reason, man. It's out of pure, unadulterated love for God and love for his children. Jesus was telling us that the kingdom doesn't grow unless someone does the hard work. You know, the kingdom of God is advanced on the backs of the saints who are pushing the kingdom, who are winning souls, who are teaching, who are preaching, who are ministering, who are greeting at the door, who are doing the offering, who are running the cameras and doing the sound and playing the band. The kingdom of God advances on the people's backs who are working for the kingdom. People who go the extra mile, people who take charge, teachers, people who show up, people who love and laugh and hug and listen, who study and prepare. By doing this stuff, you're advancing the kingdom of God. It means everything to Jesus, and that's what he has put us on earth for. When I see Mike Nelson taking time off from work to go with his daughter on a missions trip, that's bringing Jesus to the people. The kingdom of God was on your back, Mike, when you're going to Africa. You're bringing Jesus to the people, and I'll, get, I'll bet they gave you it just as much as you gave them. That's the way ministry works. You minister to people, but then people begin to minister. Have you ever done a hospital visitation? One of the joys I have is to go into hospitals and I'll speak with people with cancer and they're dying. And I realize, hey, that person, I've, I've ministered to people who will not be alive the next day. Well, I, I prayed with a lady. I walked out of the room and she died right then. I'll tell you, a lot of times when I go into the hospitals and, I, and I, I'm here to minister. I'm a minister. I'm going to bring Jesus to you. And I have this like, you're lucky I'm coming. I'm a busy man. I'm coming to the hospital. I go there and they start telling me about how faithful God has been. And how much God has been good to them and how much he's done for them. And I'm sitting there going, getting smaller and smaller. And I feel so bad because I walked in with pride. And that person going through cancer, going through chemo, who's in pain at the moment, begins to minister to me. And I'm like, oh, Jesus. I've got a lot to learn. And it humbles you, man. It humbles me when I see men like Ron Maji, who probably gets two weeks off of work a year, and he takes one of those weeks, and he takes our youth group to summer camp. Have you ever been to summer camp? It ain't no picnic, brother. <laughs> Late night, early morning, is just non-stop. Go, go. No naps, man. It's summer camp. And there's Ron, 40-some. No, I don't know how old you are. <laughs> There's Ron taking time out with my daughter and Mike's daughter and our kids, and he is going. It's, it's, it's awesome. He's taking the kingdom of God with him. He's taking care of God's children. Yeah, they're my children and your children, but to, my, to, to Ron, they're his children. I am blessed and honored to be around Ron, and, and, and I know a lot of you do. You, you make major sacrifices to to win the next generation for Jesus. Tom Sherman just took time off. He works at, uh, he works at nights. Oftentimes when you see Tom Sherman in church, he's worked all night Saturday night because he works nights. And he's here on Sunday morning. And he's tired. <laughs> Can you imagine working all night? A lot of people don't even come to church when they've worked all night. He comes to church. And, and he took the Royal Rangers on a trip and he had to take off time from Walmart, use, uh, use his vacation time to take our Royal Rangers up to wherever that state was that he took them last, year, last time and they went camping. That boggles my mind. That blows my mind. That is pure, unadulterated love. Love from God going right through him. It's amazing. And I see all of our leaders working so hard on Wednesday nights, the missionettes and the nursery workers, the Royal Rangers, Sunday school teachers, children's church workers. I see that we make a lot of sacrifices to teach a whole new generation 
about Jesus. And you should be proud of your making, you are making an eternal difference. You're making an eternal difference in people's lives. Some people say, well, why do you go to Africa when there's people here in America? Well, we go to Africa because God has called us to go into all the world and preach the gospel. But you know what? There's unreached people groups right here in America. Right here in Navarre, there's unreached people groups. And I know because I mingle with them. They're as dead spiritually as anybody in Africa. I was at a, I was at Waffle House, my favorite little house. <laughs> Besides God's house. <laughs> I was at God's other house. I was at the Waffle House, and there's these two teenagers on the swim team, and they're there, and they're talking dirty right behind me, talking dirty about some boys that have walked by. And I'm thinking, unreached people group right behind me. And so you know what we did? We went to the high school Saturday morning. I'm so proud of our church, man, because a lot of people talk about prayer. Not a lot of people do it. The kingdom of God is not about this about this. And so 34 of our people showed up. Is that accurate? 32? I want to be accurate. I don't want to exaggerate. We had like 32 of our people show up. And we didn't even push it. I mean, we announced it like once on a Sunday morning. And, and we did a prayer walk around our property a few weeks ago on a Wednesday night to pray for our new building. We want to build a new building. So we marched around it. And so someone said, we needed to go march around the high school. I said, yeah. So we, and then someone said, hey, the Baptist church has already got it planned. And I said, well, let's join the Baptist church. We're all pushing the kingdom of God. And we're all brothers and sisters. So we showed up with the Baptist church and another church. And we marched around that school. We prayed hard. Because when God's people pray, things happen. Supernatural things happen. Things that we could never do with money. Things that we could never do with influence. God does miracles in people's lives. And I'm, I'm tired of the devil killing our young people and stealing our young people. Are you tired of that? Man. So we've created a culture here at this church. A culture of family. We love grandma. We love mom and dad. And we love the kids. And we love Aunt Betty. <laughs> That's Julie's Aunt Betty. She, she lives here. We've created a culture. Some, some churches have created a culture like the disciples were trying to create. Do you know the disciples were creating a culture? Don't touch the master. Calm down. No running. No running. Can you see Monk? Do you ever watch the TV show Monk? <laughs> Can you see Monk as an usher in a church? That's what the disciples were like. Hey, hey, kids, calm down. There's no running. This is the master. This is Jesus. Don't, don't go near him. He's holy. <laughs> Don't go near them. Some churches are cre uh, creating a culture like that. Not me. I'm creating a culture with where we love children. You know, our our purpose statement is loving, reaching, and teaching little people. No, it's not. It's loving and reaching, <laughs> loving, reaching, and teaching all people. But we can say little people too, can we? <laughs> loving, reaching, and teaching. All people. Well, I, we had a man many years ago in this church who was an usher. He he had just he was so uptight. Oh my lord! And he was just nothing was right. We never did anything right. We were growing like crazy. We were adding new services, and, and nothing was clean enough for him. You know, what I'm talking about high D personality. You know, and, and his his old job he used to clean hospitals. Well, we ain't no hospital. <laughs> And, and, and he'd just say, Pastor, you're a good pastor, but this is the most unclean place. And, and it, it's not. I mean, it's not unclean. It's so clean. I mean, Lord, you can eat off our floors, you know. Um, and, he, and, and children drove him crazy. Children drove him crazy. You know what? Children don't drive me crazy. If they run a little bit, so what? You should have seen me tearing up the base chapel when I was a kid. Oh, my Lord. <laughs> and he would just get on me, get on me. Finally, I just, have you ever had just had enough? I don't 
my patient, I'm a very patient man, and I don't run out of patience very often, but this guy pushed me. I'm a lover. I'm not a fighter. And, and he had just pushed me beyond, because I love people and I want to grow, and he was chasing people away. And he was creating a culture of, like the disciples, and I was trying to create a culture like Jesus, loving, reaching, and teaching all people, suffer the little children to come unto me. I love kids. And, 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 and our cultures were conflicting. And finally, I said to one of our board members, the biggest, meanest board member we had, I said, he still goes here, so I'm not going to name his name. You would laugh. He's, he's a gentle giant. <laughs> he's sweet. But I said, I need you to be the mean, tough guy that I know you can be. And I need you to have a talk with this guy. <laughs> because it's going to be him leaving or me leaving, and I ain't leaving, so go have a talk. But anyways, he had a talk with him. I don't know what he said, but he was out back. And you know when men go out back, it's probably not good. <laughs> but anyways, he left the church. <laughs> He was clashing with our culture. And I think we're trying to create a culture like Jesus. Because Jesus was indignant at the attitude of the disciples towards the kids. Because Jesus was changing the paradigm and creating a culture of love, acceptance, and forgiveness. Here in this church, we put our kids first. We love them. I always say that love is commitment. You know what I'm talking about? Marriages. You know? You get out that lovey-dovey romantic feeling and you get into more mature love. More mature love is commitment. You know, you've heard me say that. But also, you know, love is multifaceted. Just like you can't boil down God into one word, right? Or God is this, or God is that. He's multifaceted. He's complex. And God is love. The Bible says love is multifaceted. Love is complex. Another great word I like to use for love is sacrifice. Mothers, you embody that word, sacrifice. Your lives are sacrifice. Mothers, if you're anything like my wife and my mother, you will go hungry and feed the family. You won't buy clothes for 15 years just so you clothe your own family. Your clothes are falling off your body, but Johnny needs some socks, and you'll go buy socks. Or, you know, you put every expense ahead of yourselves. Mothers, you embody love. You embody sacrifice. That's the kingdom of God. I think our husbands, man, I think me and you guys, all of us guys, we should take out $100. No. We should take out... We should take out $200. Because hundred dollars doesn't go very far, <laughs> and we should give it to our wives. Say, honey, for all you do, right? This bills for you. <laughs> These bills are for you, because they are given, they are loving, they're advancing the kingdom of God. They're taking care of the things of God. Their children are the things of God. Jesus loves our children. You're incredible. Incredible. Last Wednesday, we celebrated the hard, hard work and achievements of our young girls. That was the best thing we could have done. I believe we need to celebrate spiritual victories, don't you? Spiritual growth. We had an honor star ceremony. On Wednesday nights, we have the, royal, the missionettes and the royal rangers, and we have adult service in here. And the missionettes are kind of like Girl Scouts, and they win awards. And after they've won so many awards, then they graduate. And when they get to a certain point, they graduate from missionettes. So we celebrated that big time. And I went in there and I blew up balloons and I tied up around a, a fishing string. Have you ever done that? Get a big fishing string, tie, blow up a helium balloons, tie it around there and the balloon floats up, takes a string. You tie balloon after balloon after balloon after balloon after balloon. It takes a long time. And then you stretch it around and you make a big old arch out of it. And we had that, and it's very impressive, it's huge. We had this huge arch up on the stage, and we had all these other balloons up here, and, and, and the dads of the girls dressed up in suit and tie, I dressed up in a suit and tie, and we, we had cake, we had a sheet cake that was so big, and we had, um, what else did we have? We had songs, the kids, they got awards, and we clapped, oh, we clapped until our, we couldn't clap anymore. Every little girl that came up there got an ovation. <laughs> Clapping, clapping, every little boy clapping, clapping, because we even had some little boys, and so it was just phenomenal. And I'm, I'm thinking, you know, that is so great, because one dad told me that his two little girls talked about this thing all week long. 
These girls have been working hard, memorizing scripture, right? It's all about Jesus. We're putting faith in these kids, and they're learning, and they're so hungry. Don't you love it when kids are hungry to learn? These little kids are hungry, and they're learning, and they're growing. These little girls, they're so precious, man. It doesn't kill me to make some balloons. Suffered the little children. We are doing great for them. And so um, they're up here, and the dad said, those girls talked about this all week, the week before. <laughs> they talked about it all week. I guarantee you, after the service, they talked about it for another week. <laughs> we laid it on thick because we celebrated. And here's a Hebrew word I want us to get into our lexicon at the Bar First Assembly. It's called Ebenezer. Ebenezer. There are moments in time where we accomplish spiritual goals in our lives. They're called Ebenezer moments. And Ebenezer means this. Thus far the Lord has helped us. Thus far the Lord has helped us. So here's, here's the deal. When you set a goal in your life, everybody needs to set goals in your life. I want to be a doctor, okay? Well, along the way, you're going to have a lot of awesome goals. Graduate from college, go get into medical school. <laughs> Graduate from medical school, you know, residency, and you're going to become a doctor. Whatever your goals are that you set, your God-given goals, man. When you finish one of your goals, that's an Ebenezer moment. And you need to celebrate it. Your family and you and those around you need to celebrate those moments. So Wednesday night, we're celebrating an Ebenezer moment for those little girls. They're going to have a lot more victories and, and Ebenezer moments in their lives. But I'll tell you what, we celebrated like they're graduating high school. I remember when this church had 30-something people in it, and um, and I said, hey dudes, I said, if we get to 100 people, I'm going to do the river dance. And I was just kind of saying that because I don't know the river dance. I'm not a dancer. But if we got 100 people in here, I was going to dance. So sure enough, one day, um, I get up to preach, and Miss Carol's in the sound room. She's going, and this funny music starts playing, Irish music. And Miss Carol's going, and I said, oh, we have 100 people. And I thought, oh, no. I don't know how to river dance, and I just shot off my big fat mouth. And so I had to do the river dance, and I just made a fool of myself, but it was worth it. Because <laughs> we had set an Ebenezer moment. A hundred people was impressive. It was awesome. And so I said, big, big, big mouth me, I said, okay, when we, we reach 200, me and Julie are going to do Dancing with the Stars. Like, this is about five years ago, Dancing with the Stars. I was really into it. Um, then I got sanctified a little bit more, and I stopped watching it. Then, and so sure enough, one day I hear this strange waltz music playing. And I looked at Julie and I said, oh no, we must have reached 200. <laughs> so me and Julie had to do the ballroom dancing. We celebrated an Ebenezer moment, a spiritual growth moment. You know why? Because more people means more souls coming to the kingdom. We're not celebrating me, but us, you know, and God blessing us. And so then I said, okay, if we get to 300, I'm going to do the Macarena. I don't know the Macarena, but I've been to football games, and they do there, and look very hard. So we reached 300, and I said, okay, whatever the Macarena was. <laughs> Amazing. Christian, Christians need Ebenezer moments to celebrate. Set God-ordained goals, man. God puts a goal in your heart, write it down. Write it down. This time next year, I'm going to be doing this. This time next year, I'm going to start my book, or I'm going to finish my book, or the Lord willing. I have this dream to start a business. I'm going to start a business, man, and I'm going to celebrate. <laughs> if I make it through the first year, I'm really going to celebrate. God ordained goals. Every December, I always preach on the victories that our church has had. It's important to celebrate victories that God has done. So in December, I'll, my favorite sermons all year. Do you guys realize we gave $100,000 to missions? We went on missions, trips, saved souls. We baptized so many people, and we did all this stuff all year round. You know what? We're making an eternal difference in the kingdom of God. <laughs> it's my favorite sermon of the whole year. It's so positive, and it's so victorious, man, because I'm celebrating what God is doing by us setting goals and doing great things. Can you recall any Ebenezer moments in your life? 
Think about it lately. Maybe you graduated from college, started a business, passed the real estate test, or bought a new house. You finished the Daniel fast. You know, we do the Daniel fast, 21 days of torture. I mean, uh, <laughs> fasting for Jesus. We do that every January. It is for me, brother. Or you prayed for 21 days. We just did 21 days of straight prayer every day. That's, that's an awesome deal, right? Uh, maybe you've prayed for something for many, many years, and finally, after you've circled that thing in prayer for many years, finally, God does a miracle and it, take, it happens. What you've been praying for, God answered your prayer. Man, you rejoice, don't you? Those are the ones, you know, that's why I think that God gives us a dream or we have a problem and we pray for it. That's why I think God waits so long to give it to us to answer our prayer. Because what are you more thankful for? Prayers that get answered the next day or a week later or prayers that you've been praying for for years and you didn't quit. It's the long ones, isn't it? We've got to have a long view. And so God will stretch out things that we're thinking, oh man, maybe I should just give up praying because it's, maybe it's not the will of God and we have all these thoughts. Man. Two Wednesday nights ago, I preached on prayer and how we need to circle our prayer, our, our dreams and goals, circle them in prayer like the Israelites marched, marching around the city of Jericho. And so after we finished our whole series on the circle maker, we had a video series. It was fantastic. Then I said, you know what? God told me to do this a month ago, but we're going to do it tonight. I said, I want everybody to come forward. And I had a whole bunch of toothpicks in my hands. I said, you know, a week ago on a Saturday night, I went out myself and took my shoes off and my bare feet. And I walked around seven times around this parking lot. And I prayed that God would give us a new building. We're in two services now. We need more space. All of our Sunday school rooms are filled. We're out. We're in a portable out there. I mean, our some our nursery's packed. I mean, God is just doing great things. And if we're going to grow, we need to stretch the wall. So we need a new building. So man, I thought, man, God, is this your will? Well, I'm just going to pray it in. I'm going to get tenacious. So I went out there and walked seven times around. Then after about the fourth time, I forgot. How many times I had walked? <laughs> Have you ever done that? Is that because I'm in my late forties? I just walked around every night three, and I'm thinking I am stupid. I forgot how many times. So when I brought the church together, we were, I said we're going to go out and do something crazy. We're going to walk around this thing, and I'll tell you, there was four cars passing us. It was like it was five o'clock, but it was I don't know seven thirty. It was almost eight o'clock. And they were lined up there. And there's our church people, man. I said, you know what? I got toothpicks here. And Iris Tatum was there. And so she just had hip surgery. But she was there. And she said, I'm going to pass them out for us. So, and, I, and, I, and I thought about this. I wanted something to give to everybody so they could remember how many times they've been around. <laughs> but also, I wanted to represent a building. Something small. And wood. Because the toothpick's made of wood. What do you build buildings out of? Mostly. Wood represents building material. Wood, so construction, progress, dreams, goals. And so we went out there, and I wasn't sure how the people were going to react. They took to it. You took to it. You started walking around and praying. I could hear people praying. And I got excited, and I was walking around, and I was praying, and we're all out there in one accord, walking, and the whole world is watching us. And you know what? We didn't even care. Let them see us. They need to see a group of people praying for heaven's sake. They see people picketing and whatever for, you know, stuff. But when do they see a group of people out there praying, right? So we're out there praying for a dream that God has given us. And so every time we got, got a toothpick, and it was hot. Remember how muggy it was? Hot. And we were sweating. And we came back in the sanctuary. We were hot. We were tired. Because if you're out of shape and you walk seven laps, you're tired. So we're out there hot and tired. And Johnny Henson said something incredible about number one, two, and three. And he had something for every number that we walked. And, and he, he just encouraged the saints. And people started encouraging. We were on fire, man. We were so pumped up. 
And I said, you remember the story of the people walking around Jericho seven times? And on the last day, they walked around seven times in one day. You know what they did when they were done? They let out a shout. Isn't that awesome? They let out a shout. Usually, you let out a shout, you let out a shout after you won the battle. They were letting out a shout before they even fought the battle. And I started thinking, that's kind of odd. Why would God say shout for joy and he hadn't even fought yet? Because the battle is the Lord's. What they did made no military sense. They're walking. They weren't even allowed to talk. They're marching, they're marching. Lord, you know they're praying. They're circling their Jericho, their biggest enemy. Their goal was prayer. Every day they're praying around that thing. They're circling that thing. God said, I want you to, on the last day, I want you to let out a shout. And so we came in the sanctuary and I said, you know what? We need to let out a shout. We're going to thank God ahead of time for the miracle that God's going to do out there on that front parking lot. He's going to have a beautiful building for us. We're going to turn this building into a school. It's going to be Navarre Christian Academy. It's going to be the most beautiful school you've ever seen. And we're going to save souls like never before. Hundreds of kids are going to be in here singing Christian songs and me and Mike and a bunch of us, we're going to start, we're going to preach to them. <laughs> it's going to be awesome. The unreached people groups are all around us. We're going to bring them in here. That's the vision that God has given us. And I said, we need to thank God ahead of time for what he's going to do. Because there's a spiritual principle in that story that you've got to get into your hearts. And as Christians, we need to understand this. Because before they even fought the battle, God said to Joshua, he said in there, it says, the city is tightly shut up. And the doors are shut up tightly. He said, but behold, I have given you this city. We haven't even started marching. We haven't even fought one time. But you've given us the city. We're shouting for joy and we haven't even fought the battle yet. Yes, because by faith, right? What is faith, right? It's believing in what we don't see. It, it, and it's so God is teaching us a spiritual principle that we need to thank Him ahead of time for what He's about to do. That's faith, my friends. So we let it a shout, and we clapped, and we shouted, and it was a victory shout, man. It was a victory shout. And I'm telling you what, I said to the guys, I said, you know what? You need to take pictures. <laughs> because this is a day, this is an Ebenezer moment. We need to take a shout of praise and thanks because the victory is already won. Isn't it great how God fights our victories for us? You know, Abraham, it was credited to Abraham as righteousness. It says that he believed God, right? His promise was that his wife was going to get pregnant. She's 90, he's 100. And he believed God. And because he believed God, it was credited to him as righteousness. And he received his promise. So before any bloating, anything with his wife, any signs of pregnancy, he believed God and his credits to him as righteousness. My friends, we have got to believe God. It's going to be credit to us as righteousness, and he is going to make it happen on your behalf. Why do you think God says this? He says, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. He will repay people. He doesn't say, you got dissed, you got hurt, you got offended, you go, you go get them. God doesn't say that. He says, you just pray, you calm down, I will go get them. Right? I will go get them, take care of them, you'll be begging me for mercy, like Moses did. <laughs> he was always begging God, okay, stop killing the Israelites. <laughs> right? God will take care of God will fight your battles. That's why God says, seek first the kingdom of God. And all these things will be added unto you. Our job is to seek God. Our God is to do the prayer marches. Our God is to our, our job is to pray and say, God, I fully rely on you. Remember the acronym Frog? Fully rely on God. Okay? Stop trying to mani manipulate. Stop trying to make things happen. You just pray. You just pray. 
Say, God, you know, I could probably make this happen. I could probably do this. I'm skilled. I'm clever. I've got finances. I just know how to manipulate things. I could probably get this done. But you know what? I'm going to let you show off. It's always better when God does something for you. I'm just going to seek you. Seek first the kingdom of God. I'm going to seek you first and watch you move on my behalf. You know, when you do that, when you relinquish control, we always want to be in the driver's seat, don't we? We need to let Jesus take the wheel. We always want to be in control. Man, you sit back and you pray and you let God fight your battles. You let God bring in that dream. You let God bring in whatever He has told you He's going to do for you. You sit back and you watch God work. It'll be better than if you did it yourself. Man, God is so good. Amen. Hebrews 11 says, Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance of what we do not see. That's confidence. That's assurance. Are you confident? Do you have an assurance of what God is going to do in your life? Some of you are worried. Do you remember? Here's a, I'm going to close with this illustration. Do you remember Mary and Martha? Mary and Martha. Martha's busy. Remember? Jesus came out of the house. Martha is very busy. She's preparing. There's a lot of stuff to prepare, right? So she's working, working, working. And what's Mary doing? Nothing. In Martha's eyes, she was doing nothing. She was at the feet of Jesus just listening to him. And she, Martha comes to Jesus and said, Jesus, will you tell Mary to get busy? I'm doing all this stuff. And he says, Martha, Martha, Martha. You're worried about so many things, right? He says, Mary is concerned about the best thing. And I will not take it away from her. He said, really, there's only a few things that matter, and especially one thing that matters. And Mary is worried about that one thing, and I'm not going to take it away from her. She was at the Lord's feet. Isn't that awesome? Wow. Go after God like Mary. And all these things will be added unto you. You won't have to worry. Martha, you're worried about so many things. Some of you worry about stuff so much it's killing you. Do you know if you worry about stuff enough, it'll start affecting your physical body? Some of you are having physical problems because you're worried about stuff and it's killing you. You need to give it to God. Amen? Let me ask if you'll stand to your feet today. We're going to close with this. Let me ask you to bow your heads if you would. Let's just begin to pray. Let me ask you a question. How many of you say, Pastor, I've been worried about so many things. I've been stressed out. I've been awake at night. How many say, Pastor, I need prayer. Just lift your hand and show me. I'm not trying to embarrass anybody. I just really believe in prayer. Yes, I see the hand. I see the hand. I see it. You're worried. Can I tell you something? Just give it to Jesus right now. Give it up to Him. And you start praying, seeking Jesus. You know, it, it, a lot of times our mode of operation is we get on our knees and we pray to Jesus. We say, God, I need this, and God, I need that, and I need this. And, and you know, we just come with him, to Him with a laundry list of things we want Him to do for us. And I can imagine how God feels. What, you just come to me for stuff? You don't really want to be around me? Let's try a, a new tactic, if you could call it that. Let's go to God and say, God, I'm just here to get to know you. How are you doing today? God, I'm here. Yes, I have needs and I have worries. Don't I always? But you know what, Lord? I am here because I want to know you and I want to build my relationship with you. I want to know you and I want you to know me. Can you do that? I guarantee you, he knows your need even before you ask it. If you'll get in your little prayer closet and you will pray. Let me ask you this. We've got a few minutes before we quit. And, and I would like you, if you raise your hands, if you'd come forward, and I want to pray for you. Will you come forward and let me pray with you? I guarantee you, you're not going to be the only one down here. Let me ask you who are, you're back in, 
to the audience. How many are saying, Pastor? I hear what you're saying. And, 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 and you're not even a Christian. You don't even know Jesus as your Savior. How many say, Pastor, I need to give the Lord my heart. I'd like to be a Christian. I'd like to serve Him. How many say, that's me, Pastor. Raise your hand. I want to pray for you today. Anybody out there? Uh, let me ask you. If God has brought you through something, if you've just recently had an Ebenezer moment in your life, and you're on fire right now, you're on fire right now, God's done something great in your life, I want you to come forward, and I want you, while you're on top of things, I want you to pray for people going through some stuff right now. Will you do that? Get out of your seat. It's just going to be a minute, but I need help. I need help right now. Pray, come down to help me pray. Board members, come down to help me pray. Prayer partners, come down to help me pray. I'd like everybody down here to have someone with a hand on their back.